again, I am impressed by um, once again I'm impressed by your decision to come here and participate in the lecture series on, on a beautiful day. And uh, I promise you that your time will be very well spent. Our lecturer today is Mr. William Lohenberg and um, Dean Elaine Leader, who you all are, is going to introduce him. So, here's Dean Leader. Thanks. Um, I'm thrilled to be introducing our speaker today. I met him just uh, probably about six or eight months ago, and uh, I've had some wonderful times talking about, the, believe it or not, sharing genocide and Holocaust stories. You have to be a little perverse to really enjoy these, but I really do. Um, and so let me tell you a bit about Bill Lohenberg, um, and also, uh, well, Bill Lohenberg's a Holocaust survivor. He was sent to the death camps when he was 14 years old, and he survived Auschwitz, Dachau, and six other camps. But he lost his parents, his younger sister, and the rest of his family. He came to America after the war, unable to speak English. He served in the United States Army during the Korean War. And when he returned from duty, he began to build his real estate business in San Francisco. He married had two children and now has two grandchildren. Mr. Lohenberg was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to the commission that built the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., where he served as the vice chairman. Recently, Mr. Lohenberg was appointed by Governor Schwarzenegger as chairman of the new California Task Force on Holocaust Genocide, Human Rights, and Intolerance in Education. In education. And I should say, we should be very honored to have one of the founders of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C. right here in our own midst. So please welcome warmly, Bill Lohenberg. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you about an issue I happen to believe is important to all of us, especially to young people who may have had a grandfather <coughs> or grandmother who left this continent for the, the second, the Second World War to fight tyranny. As you may know in your history classes, that in the First World War, yes, the Americans went to Europe in 1917, but those were volunteers. But in 1939 and thereafter, the draftees were sent to another continent to take on a very inhuman human being who had built up a country, namely Germany, into something that no one could have dreamt about. Now remember that Germany in those days was probably considered to be one of the most civilized nations on this, on this earth. They had the finest universities, they had the finest schools. The Americans were sending their young people to Germany to study medicine, engineering, and other trades. Our schools were still in, in its infancy and they were small and not enough for the amount of people who want to go to college and to learn specific uh, lines of work like medicine. No one, no one could have believed that a civilized nation, a nation as such would be occupied by their own people and transferred into a country where murder was accepted. As you well know, during the Second World War, 51 million people were killed because of the war that Germany started. 51 million. Now you have read and you have heard during your education here that there was a Holocaust and that Holocaust killed 6 million Jews but there also were 6 million Christians. 5 million Christians killed. 6 million Jews, 5 million Christians. 
Then there were 600,000 gypsies killed. Then there were Catholic priests, Catholic nuns, Protestant priests, and Protestant clergy. In the concentration camps that we lived with uh, during my three and a half years in the various camps, especially Auschwitz. I'm, I, gonna, I'm gonna take you to my travel log until I came to this, this country, until I came to San Francisco. I was born in a very small town right at the Dutch border in Germany. My family had lived there and found gravestones with the markings on it going back to the 15th century, 14 before the Inquisition, 1450, 1460, etc. Gravestones are marked, of course, by, by, by those dates, and, and, I've, and I had someone take pictures of them for me. So we lived in these areas for a long, long time. My father, my father's brother, both my grandfathers, my mother's brother, they all fought for the Germans because they were local, they were citizens of that country. My father's brother was, was killed during the First World War. I'm named after him. So they were part of a community that they thought was part of their birthright, part of their life, and hoped that they would end their life there, like all of us expect to, to live a normal and, and free life. It wasn't to be meant as such. In 1935, in 1930, let me go step on back. In 1932, when I went, I was in, in elementary school. I'm a Jew. I was then told to sit in the back of the class. I was the only Jew in this school of 800 boys. There were boys' schools and girls' schools that were separated in those days, in that area especially. And uh, I got one, two report cards. First grade and second grade was the end, and I had six years of education. It was the end of my education. And while I'm able to speak English, etc., and, and I've educated myself, I got it strictly by going to night school for two years here, and I'll get to that later, and by reading a lot. A lot. I read all the time, past midnight. That's how you, I well, educate myself. As a matter of fact, I can spell better than my wife, who's a Stanford graduate. <laughs> because I read slow. In uh, 1935, my family had, missed their, had, had lost their business, and we left overnight to Holland, which was about an hour's drive. And there my father and mother had to start all over again. The house they had built before they got married, or the year they got married, uh, was gone, they had to leave it, and they, we were small children my sister and I, and uh, Howard was great for us. We were welcome, it was a free nation, there was no prejudice, and it worked for a while until May the 10th, 1940, when the Germans decided to occupy Holland and Belgium and France and Denmark and Norway, go right to the coast. On the way, they were hoping to England uh, we had about a year, year and a half of, of no, not too normal, but more than, more than we, got to, we, we found out later, it was, it was livable. Then the entire community of Jews living in this town were arrested like the rest of Holland, and we all went into a camp in Holland first. We stayed for, for a few months. I was taken away from my parents, and I was 15. I was sent to Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz was two camps. There were several others, but Auschwitz and about a few yards away is Birkenau. That's where the gas chambers were. I stayed in Auschwitz for a few days and we were sent to Birkenau. This was the first transport from Holland in six months which was kept alive, 200 men. Every Tuesday out of the camp in Holland, they had a train leaving with about 4,000 people. And this, for some, God knows what, but uh, I'm to believe in God very dearly. Uh, he saved me by being on this first transport after six months where anyone was kept alive. And um, I was in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, and a week later, 
was working in a wood gang right at the gas chambers. And a friend of mine says, look over there. And there I saw my parents and my sister marching into the gas chambers. I thank God for the moment they didn't, they didn't see me, because they thought I was dead already. But they were killed that day. I fainted and I was beaten up and I still left scars on my back. And I, I can't take a shower straight back. I have to turn my, to the side. I was beaten uh, by, 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 the, by a German assessment. We stayed in, in, in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, which is the same command, but uh, Birkenau had where the gas chambers and the crematoria were. Until 43, at the tail end of the Warsaw Uprising, as you may have read, read, there was an uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. At that point, there were 360,000 people in this ghetto, brought in, aside from the city of Warsaw, also from other parts of that country. And that when the Germans decided that the ghetto had to be liquidated, they started bombing, and they, were, and they took trains every, every other day to another camp, which had gas chamber, that was Treblinka. We were, we were sent from Birkenau to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau to, to Warsaw to demolish the ghetto, to destroy the evidence, and to burn bodies. We burned thousands and thousands of bodies for months at end. We stayed in Warsaw, uh, and we were amplified, by the way, by people. Uh, the total people brought to Warsaw was 12,000 people. From the Balkans, which were then occupied by the Germans, they brought those people in. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, a lot, uh, 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 Romania, some, etc., etc., et and of course Poland and other parts. When the Russians broke through on the, on the Eastern Front, as you will know, there was a war between Germany and, and Russia, which, went out, which started in 1939, was still going on. And finally, the Russians woke up and they decided to stop to fight, because they had a tough time as it was, but they were. It was better for them before than when the Germans came. They were hoping it would be the opposite, which wasn't so. so then they started fighting from, from uh, Odessa on, the, on going west. The Russians came on the gates of Warsaw, and the Germans had instructions, the, the, the camp guards had instructions, the commander from Berlin to destroy all the people, to kill all the people in the camp. There were at that point 3,600 people alive. 600 were couldn't walk any longer. And 3,000 could. The, the Polish underground, and there was an underground in Poland against the Germans. It's not very effective, but they, they tried. They tried very hard. They gave, sent a message to the Germans by saying, if you kill these people, there will not a German coming out of the city of Warsaw. So they got smart, apparently, and they marched out of Warsaw against the will of the Berlin hierarchy. And we marched for weeks due west, then past the river where they drowned half of the people. We kept on marching and marching until we got back into the boxcars the third time. And uh, when we ended up in Dachau, of the 3,600 who were in Warsaw and the 3,000 who marched out, there were 240 people left who could get out of the boxcars. I'm one of those. We stayed in southern Germany outside of Dachau in a side camp where we had to build underground munitions factories for the Germans, where they were building the V2, which was then the most prominent weapon uh, under construction and was used against England. Various was were sent to, to, to London and uh, destroyed parts of that city. On April 30th, 1945, the American army broke through and they found the camp. They had no idea. Those soldiers didn't know what they saw. They had no idea where they were, but they saw these camps. The wires, of course, were always under heavy, uh, high voltage. And we had to scream at them, don't touch the wires. And we saw those people in uniform. We know they weren't Germans. And uh, some, some of my friends could, uh, understood English. I didn't. And then they had to bring in the engineers and, of course, cut the wires and start giving us food. Well, about 10% of the people that liberated, they died because they couldn't handle the food. It was just, we, had, we were living at about 200 calories a day at the best. Uh, I weighed 80 pounds when I was liberated. Uh, the Dutch government at that time, which was liberated before April 30th, Holland was, 
they sent trucks immediately from the army to, to Dachau to pick up the people from Holland. And I was one of those, went back to Holland, hoping that maybe I had seen wrong to see my parents and my sister again, but I did not find them, of course. Uh, I stayed in Holland for a bit, about a year, and I had a very tough time. Psychologically, mentally, it was hard to, 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 to fathom anything I'd gone through. I decided to go to Switzerland, which I was sent to by a Dutch firm. They hired me, and uh, since I speak German also, and some Italian I learned in school, I went to Switzerland and northern Italy. And uh, I stayed there for three years. And uh, then I was told by the Swiss police I better leave the country because I was involved in helping um, some people who were needed to get to other parts of the world and to get them on trains, to get them on boats. And me. I was watched and the police got me and they put me on a plane back to Holland. And then I called my uncle in San Francisco, who, who my mother, one of my mother's brothers had moved there in the early 30s. And on December the 5th, 1949, I landed in New York. By the first week of January, I was in San Francisco. And let me tell you, that's when my life started. And today, as I get older, I, I, cannot, I cannot share with you how it feels to, to have a country that I could call my own because I was stateless. Because as you know, the Hitler laws made all the Jews stateless, all the gypsies stateless, anyone but uh, the, the white Germans were, were not made stateless. They were Germans, but anybody else was made stateless. So for the first time in, I, in, 19, in, in 1950, I lived in a country, and I wasn't naturalized there, but I decided in '53 to join the American army to pay my duties to the people who liberated me. So during the Korean War, I spent two years in the, in the U.S. Army, and I was naturalized American citizen in 1954. So in '55, I came back to San Francisco, and I've since had lots of luck, a wonderful family, children and grandchildren and a successful business. I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that it, it doesn't come just because the way I tell the story that takes 10 minutes. It takes a lot of tenacity and faith in God. And I believe that. Even though I had lots of arguments with God by saying, where were you? And where are you? But they didn't answer me, but at least he kept me alive. But the tenacity that I felt and the determination that I wanted to tell the story kept me alive. And of course, the, the biggest problem was luck that the transport, uh, transports I was on didn't get gassed, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's basically my story. I don't want to go into the gaudy part of it because uh, you can read about it, you read about it. In Auschwitz, of course, we all were tattooed with a number on the arm, which I have. We are shaved, and the only garment you have is a pair of pants and a jacket, the striped uniforms that you have seen in pictures. There's no underwear. There were no toothbrushes. There were no toothpaste. There was, there was no toilet paper. You were just two pieces of, of clothing, a jacket and a pair of pants. That's what you had. You got a small piece of bread every morning. If you didn't eat, every evening rather, and if you didn't eat it real fast, it would be stolen from you. But mostly if you kept it and thought you could keep it overnight, the rats would eat it. Because you had to eat it fast. And I'll give you an idea. It came to me a few days ago when, when we, someone talked about diamonds. So, uh, in Warsaw, the destruction of the city, when you take a city, a major, major city, a capital of a country, and, and, and throw bombs at it and, and kill people, and we destroyed the buildings with dynamited them. We found money, we found clothing. If there was food, we ate it fast, which we very rarely did find. But every so often somebody came along, they found diamonds, or a watch, or I think, or rings. So this man walks up to me one day. He says, look at this. And in his hand, he had four diamonds. There were over 10 carats of diamonds in his hand. And uh, I remember the picture, and I asked somebody later on how many carats there was, and somebody knew this, who was in Amsterdam, was a large diamond industry, as you well know. 
And he says, I'll take your bread for three days and you can have the diamonds. I, for some reason, I got smart. I said, if I give you my bread, what am I going to do? He says, I don't care. Give me your bread and then you get the diamonds. So I turned him down. He went to the next guy. The next guy, there was one person who had only been in the camps for a few months and he thought this was a big thing. So he gave him his bread for three days and he got the diamonds. And ten days later, this man was dead because he died of hunger. Couldn't eat the diamonds. So wealth is only good if you have some other elements to sustain you. But you can't eat diamonds. And you can't eat an, a dollar bill unless you have the chance to go to a store and buy something with it. And I want you to, to think about this because that's how life is. I saw it with my own eyes. So I'm not impressed unless, and I know my wife has a diamond ring, but uh, it's a different world today. It's a wedding ring, right? <laughs> but, uh, but one has to realize that there's more to life than just a, a, a glory and, and, and wealth. I think the most important thing, integrity, that a person should have, and tenacity. And I feel very strong that you young people can make a difference in this world. And that's what I'm doing and speak to various schools in this area. I go to eight schools now. And I only started this about eight, nine years ago. And talk to young people like you to tell and to ask you not to be complacent by saying, well, let the politicians handle it. No, we have to control our politicians. I'm not saying everybody should be a politician, but we have to know what's happening to our destiny. We have to know that we have people representing us who have honesty and integrity and keep the system going as we expect it to be and the way we have been used to. And that's why I feel so very strong to be emphatic to you by saying, be involved and you can make a difference. I really believe that. So I stop for, for a moment and I would like you to ask me some questions. I'm sure you have some questions. Anybody? Let, let me get, ask myself a question. Because I was, last week, when I spoke to a school in San Francisco, one person asked me, and it, if it was so terrible, why didn't you commit suicide? And I answered her as follows. Every morning, there were carts with prisoners went alongside the electric fence and they picked up hundreds of people who couldn't handle it. There was a lot of suicides. They just couldn't handle it. So that, that was uh, in our sight all the time. I never thought this way. When this girl asked me the question, I said, I never thought of suicide. I want to tell the story. And maybe my age had to do with it because I, I, I was 16 years, 17 years old then. But the, the fact remains that this was all the time. The dogs, the shootings, the beatings, and the electric wires. Any question? Yes, please. I wanted to know how, after you, for such a long time, had, had an experience that was opposite from everything you were raised with in terms of decency and integrity and honesty and respecting life. And later when you came to California, you could become a human being in the way you were brought up before all this happened to you again and relate to human beings in the way that we expect it all to relate to each other. First, I mean, most of all, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> most of all, I had fabulous parents. I only knew them until I was about 15. But they were strict, and the grandparents. But I, I, gave, I gave almost all the credit to my mother. I mean, the boys get close to the mother, but my sister was closer to, her, to my father. That happens, I think, in most families. But I was close to my mother, 
and my mother's mother, my, my grandmother. That taught me how to live. I also believed in God and felt that somewhere, somehow, I have to, I have to survive this. I had luck. I had luck because that I wasn't picked to go to the gas chamber because every Sunday there was selection. If you couldn't, if you couldn't walk the next morning or that afternoon, then you went to Barracks 13, which was a gas chamber. But um, it was the will to live. And then when I finally settled for my own life in this country, I, uh, I wanted to be an American. It was very, very important. I never talked about my past life to my children until they were 14, 15 years old. I didn't want them to be influenced by my history, which was, there was nothing to brag about. It was horrible. And it worked. Because when I took them aside one at a time, they said, Dad, don't worry, we looked it up already. We, we did our own research. They didn't want me to talk about it. They were very protective, obviously. But I wanted to be like every other person in this country. I went to school four nights a week to learn English. And that's why I joined the army. I wanted to be part of it. Now, was it easy for me to be in, in a, a soldier again with that background? No. But people were wonderful to me. I still have close friends from the days, in, from the 50s, who were in the army together. That it worked for me. Does it work for everybody? I'm sure it didn't. I needed that. I wanted that. The thing that bothers me more as I get older is when I was your age, what my parents must have felt about their children. No one would play with them anymore in the camps a little later. And I think about it so often now, how they must have felt what happened to their children. I, as a child, it doesn't hit you as much because you go with the flow, as we said today. So I, I'm sure that's what it was. I don't remember everything. But my parents must have suffered terribly. What happened to that the children I didn't get a report card, it's in the back of the class, etc., etc. So there's those, those things I think about a lot as I get older. And I, I feel very strong also that I was lucky. I was lucky. Yes, please. Um, I wonder if you could speak about relationships in the camps and after the camps. And were they important in helping you stay alive or not? Were people helpful or were they very independent and just trying to survive for themselves? Basically, everybody was on their own. Uh, I was lucky uh, to one extent when I got to Auschwitz <clears throat> while I was standing in line to be tattooed a person walked up to me and he says hello he knew me he was also like he got there six months before from Holland he knew my sister better even though he was a little older than, than me and he knew my parents and he kind of the first thing he said to me, he says, don't drink the water. The water was typhoid. So he went on to the floor and picked up a pebble, a stone. He said, keep that in your mouth whenever, whenever you're not eating and, and activate your saliva gland. And that's, I never drank water in the camps. And that's how there was somebody who, could, who told me. After I'd been in Auschwitz for a while, I was run over by a lorry, by, by a cart. And... Uh, in the selection process every Sunday morning I would have been sent to back 13 in gas chambers he, he was there because he had more freedom of uh, when, uh, walking, uh, walking around the camp than anyone I knew because he'd been there for over a year and a half and uh, <clears throat> when he saw that he hit me in the rafters in his barracks it was a different barracks he hit me in the rafters and he shared his food with me. And then when and we stayed together during the rest of it, we went to Warsaw together, we went to Dachau together, etc. And we were liberated together. 
As a matter of fact, we were living next to a camp where there were 42, 42, 45 women who were from various parts of Europe. And they were about 80% not here anymore. They were I mean, hungry and beaten up, etc. And he looks at this one girl, he says, is she beautiful? I said, are you crazy? The poor girl can hardly breathe. He fell in love with her, and three weeks later I found, I found a clergy, and they got married. And we lived together, we went back to Holland together, and we, we found a, an a, a apartment, a place in the basement in Amsterdam. The three of us slept on the same mattress. We were like brothers, we were brother and sister. That, so that, it all involves how you think of life. And then when I came to this country, he, um, he found a, uh, uh, or a person found him was from, from Salisbury, Odessa then. And he decided, he made a very good proposition that he would work for this company that his cousin had. And he went to Odessa and he lived there for many, many years. And she died and he, they have visited me 13, 14 times. I think the 14th trip, he had a heart attack here and he died. But uh, he was already older then. Uh, so there was this one friendship. I have one other friend who lives in Paris, who was also in, in four camps with me. But that's the only people I know who are alive. And you didn't have the friendships like you would think today you would have. Because you're only worried about one thing, survival, survive, survive. The beatings, you slept for four hours if you're lucky, and you know you've seen the pictures. You slept on, a, on, a, on a wooden planks, one blanket for six people, four or five, no, no pillowcases, or pillows rather. You slept there. And, and so there was a, it, it was a life that one cannot picture, I explain. So the friendships, yes, there was some respect, but there were also people who were, who were insane. And they were stealing your bread because they were so destitute of hunger. So, 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 so emaciated. So that all that, all that uh, yes, happened and deep friendships, no. It just, there was no time for that. Yes, please. I came to San Francisco, my uh, uncle introduced me and told me there was an employment agency for, for refugees. People knew here after the war. I went to them and they had a committee, five, five men, who, uh, who sat there once a month and listened to the, the presentation by the staff. And, and my case was presented to those five men. One man says, send them in, I'll give them a job. I couldn't speak English, and uh, I, I, was, I just started going to school four nights a week. He gave me a job, and uh, then it was in January 1950, and by 53 I went in the army, 55 I went back to him, and he became like a, like a surrogate father to me. And then he introduced me to my wife. He made me a partner. I worked seven days a week. You know, I didn't have money to go to movies, but he was so good to me that there was a, 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 an example of, of a, a person who had come to San Francisco in 1911 from the East Coast and made a success of himself, but he also did not forget to help other people. And he got me involved in some charities. He, um, he had me over for dinner, he and his wife, once a month sometimes more often. So it, uh, it was important that I also proved myself to him and his wife. That, that this, this was doable and I appreciate what he, what he was doing for me. So that's how I got started. Then I've had friends and I still have great friends and I think to me friendships are as important as, as, as anything I can think of. The loyalty of friends. 
And that works. I can assure you it works. Yes, please. I can't hear you. Have you gone back to Europe? I went back three times to, to Germany. Holland, I've gone, I go more often. It's very hard. The first time, I thought I could find my parents there. And to every place I could think of, they could have gone. It was futile. Then the second time, I wanted my children to see the house I was born in. And they were about seven and nine years old. And when they saw that, and they saw the way I was reacting with us, I said, let's get out of here. I said, let's have lunch. No, we're not eating it. It was only about an hour's drive from where my uncle lived in Holland. And uh, then I went back once more when the United States Army wanted to uh, go to Normandy and, uh, and the American cemeteries in Western Europe to bring some soil back for Arlington. They were doing something, building something. So there were about four of us were taken by the, by the U.S. Army uh, and, and spent about 10 days to do this. And we brought it back to Arlington. It was a big ceremony, and I spoke there. And uh, that was the last time, and I don't think I will go back. It's just, uh, especially as I get older, it's, uh, once and twice and the third one was enough. That doesn't mean that I have hatred, and that's one more thing I think I should say to you. There's no hatred in me. Do I think about it a lot? Yes, but hatred is only hurting yourself. Because you can't hate uh, people who were born after the war. You have to be understanding of what, what happened, what their parents or grandparents did. But, but the hate will, will, will eat you up, in my opinion. So hate is not what I, what I can live on or want to live on. But I don't want to go there so that uh, so I won't be tempted. Yes, please. Thank you for sharing your story. I wanted to know a little more about your family. Did you bring up, did you live in a Jewish faith household? Was it Orthodox or what was that about you? I was brought up in, in a very, very religious family. We went to a uh, religious school every day after public school. We studied the Bible seven days a week. My mother especially made sure that, that, that we studied. I'd never learned to speak the Hebrew language. It wasn't done while we were living. But uh, we, we learned to, to, to read the Old Testament and other books of the religion. And I've never changed that. Neither have my, my wife and my children. I think it's important because if there's no religion, there's something missing, I think, in anybody's life because there's, there's a God somewhere. He's not always perfect, but uh, he does the best he can, I'm sure. I know we have to do the same. But we have to have faith in God. So my religion, yes. And let me tell you, there are people who came out of the camps who said, no more. Oh, no, there's no question. Not many, not many. You'd be surprised how few, percentage-wise, I'd say no more religion. That, I don't know anyone, basically. Not my, not my uh, acquaintances. But, uh, yes, I, 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 I don't want to change that. Thank you for the question. Yes, please. I kill a lot of bees. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I didn't go. <laughs> I didn't go. To, I didn't go into combat. And uh, but uh, I was in the, in the infantry, heavy weapons company. But there again, um, it worked for me because mostly because of friendships in the army. That that, that my life was made fairly easy. Did I like it? No. I like it better now that I can talk about them when I was there. But, but I'm grateful that I had that opportunity and thank, thank the American soldiers that they liberated me. I 
I didn't hear you too well. Say it again, I didn't hear you. Let me tell you a story. After the war, obviously, I, I got to know some survivors. They had, re had married or remarried, and they had children. And uh, we became friends, about three, three families, I remember now, vividly. And they used to talk to their children every meal. I never had those kind of steaks. I never had this kind of bread. I never had this. I never. And they messed up their children. That they made these kids feel so guilty that they couldn't function. And I can tell you, these kids didn't make it in life. I know what happened to them because I left Holland. And I, I talked to myself about that. I will not talk to my children like that if I have children. And I never did. I want to be like, like all of you guys. And it was important to me. And luckily, uh, my wife understood that. She never questioned me. She never asked me either. She knew, of course. And she, she was raised in San Francisco. But um, the, no, I didn't want my children to be affected by that. <coughs> and it worked for me. Does that answer it? Yes, please. Um, have you been able to get some sort of um, answer or some sort of reconciliation with God? So, okay. No, uh, I didn't question it to, in, to death because I was too involved, willing to succeed and get to, get to have a normal life and, and, and educate myself. That's why I read every night till past midnight. Uh, if you ask too many questions, you get confused too. It isn't fair. Because God doesn't answer. He doesn't, whatever, he, he does it. But I feel very comfortable that uh, it's not that everything is perfect for me. Life is difficult. And uh, sometimes, you know, I'm not as happy as I may be today. But by and large, I have to talk to myself. I talk to myself all the time. And I want to talk, if that answers, but I want to talk, but it relates to another thought that just came to my mind. When the state legislature here in the state of California passed a law to teach Holocaust studies, genocide, human rights, etc., this institution, which has about, we're going to have ten, we're going to have ten members on the board, all religions, there's some Jews, Armenians, Chinese, Christian religious people, that we have a whole segment of the, which is represented, represented of the, of the people of California. Because I happen to believe that, for instance, the Armenian genocide killed thousands and thousands of people. It's not being taught enough, in my opinion. It's not talked about enough. But I'm very often in, in Fresno, which is a very large Armenian community. I have some close friends there. And we talk about it. Of course, they were born here. Uh, I think you young people should know that this was not the first time there was a genocide or discrimination uh, in the world. It happened before the Holocaust came. It so happened that the Holocaust happened to a period of time that I'm still alive from that. And you, you, you won't see many of you. I'm probably the, the youngest survivor you'll ever see alive today. Most of them are dying very fast now, in the 80s and 90s. So I feel very strong that we have to think in terms of, look what's happening in Rwanda. Look what's happening in, in the Balkans. Look what's happening in the Middle East. And we, we ought to think about how many times it has happened to mankind. Not in this country to that extent, thank God. But to the religions. There's a thirst to have one religion in the world. Not acceptable to me. Everybody should have freedom to have whatever religion he or she wants. So we should think about that and defend your religion, whatever it is. No question about it. 
But we are living in times which are not easy for a lot of people, difficult. The terrorist today, unacceptable. Because they're killing children and, and women and children and old people and anybody can get their hands on. And we have that obligation to understand what this country stands for and how we, we have to defend what this country stands for. So that, that uh, we haven't learned enough. We haven't learned enough. We go to Africa, some terrible things happen there. And, and we should be aware of that. And we have to help. So uh, all in all, it's up to each and every one of us, each and every one of us who can make a difference. It starts with one person, and two, and three, etc. And that's how we can protect you all. You all hopefully, all you're going to get married and have children. So you want to make sure that they have a peaceful life. Any other questions, please? Yes, please. Our course theme this semester is What Does Never Again Mean? And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to the work you've done with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and this new task force that's being formed to try to make sure that that actually happens rather than just being something we just say. Well, since you mentioned the, the museum I got involved in, and I used to be in Washington every month for about 12 years, it took uh, five of us. We raised enough money, the government gave us the land, we raised the money, there was no tax money spent on this. We raised the money nationally to build this museum. We have had over 20 million people in the 10 years it's in existence go through this. A lot of school children. The schools have to wait now six months before they can get an appointment. From all over the country. Who has been, who has been to the museum? That's, this gives you an idea how many people have been to this museum. Every class I teach, there's always a large percentage kids who have been to that museum, because it's important that they understand what I'm talking about. And uh, the, uh, the support, the support we have had from, from the government, our government, and the, and the Pentagon, is unbelievable. Anything we needed, within reason, they never turned us down. I used to sit with uh, Colin Powell when he was Secretary of Defense and we needed something to help, he was there. He was always there. Our, uh, we had a, one of our Californians who was the Secretary of the, of the Army, he was there. Uh, so the Chief of Staff, Colin Powell, he was. The White House, every president, without exception, they were ready for us. So, uh, and, and, and now we have the fruits of that. We see 20, over 20 million people have gone through that museum. Not only Americans from overseas, most heads of state or ambassadors or upper level dignitaries, when they come to Washington, they come to that museum. It's amazing. I mean, we never expected this, this kind of, a, this kind of attendance. We have over 400 people, 400 employees. And, and the cost is borne by money we raised. Now we're in the midst of raising money for an endowment fund, so we don't have to ever worry for the next generation. Because we want the children to know why their grandfathers were killed on another continent, among other things. And by prejudice, has, has killed 51 million people in a period of, of, of five years. 51 million people were killed during the Second, during the Second World War. It's awesome. And we, hopefully that somewhere, somehow, uh, the museum has a little, little place in American history to, to show what happens if we don't pay attention. Any other questions? It's five o'clock my deadline. <laughs> yeah? If there are no more questions. Uh, I don't know if I forget it. Let me, let me look at my, I always put my list out that I should talk about in honor of. I, I hope that most of you have, have read um, Anne Frank. Anne Frank did as good a job as anyone to tell about her, her past. 
She died in Bergen-Belsen after Auschwitz. I knew her father. I met her father after the war. He just died a few years ago. And he was in Auschwitz. And there's another book, Viktor Frankl. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. It's worthwhile reading for you. Because it gives you an idea. Then there's the, the famous uh, uh, Levy the Italian. Primo Levi. I never met him, but uh, I read his book. Well, he couldn't handle it. He committed suicide about 15 years, 15, 20 years ago. He just couldn't handle He was in Auschwitz. He couldn't handle it any longer. He wrote the book, and it was so, his life was so hard. He lived in, in, in Rome, I think. It was Rome or Florence. And uh, he committed suicide. He couldn't handle it. Yes, please. I just have a question that relates to that. Although uh, most survivors that I know or know of have uh, died of natural causes, there, do, there does seem to be a certain number who have reached a certain age and who have, like Primo Levi, committed suicide. And I wonder if you could um, give us some idea of why you think that might have happened. Why, why kill himself? Well, why, why one would um, oh, thank you. go to that... Um, that extent? Well, to get to old thank age. You. And, uh, well, if I can speak for my, about myself, I want to be 100 years old. And my friends always laugh and I say, and, and why? The joke is, I want to show that, that I beat Hitler. <laughs> now, having said that, the few survivors, and if you take, you know, of the, the war, uh, they made their own life and had the tenacity and the willpower. And I'm sure also the help of family or friends or acquaintances. There's no one can explain. But I can see why Primo Levi killed himself because there are moments where he says, especially when you said to yourself, what's it all about? Nothing has changed. So may as well knock it off. Let's get it over with. He must have felt this way. He was a very bright man, I'm told. We had a mutual friend, but I never met him. Uh, not everybody is strong enough. I can tell you this, that I'm now 77. And there's no question that I'm more vulnerable today, mentally, to the past than I was 20, 30, 40 years ago. There I was so imbued with myself of wanting to succeed and to start a new life and to build a life. Now, it's past, I did all that. So I, I think more, think more about my parents. But uh, I also have the willpower that I told you, I want to be 100 years old. And um, that, uh, that is important to me. I just want to be around to talk to, to people like you sitting here and to tell you the obligation you have in life it doesn't come easy. It doesn't come easy. But it's better than the opposite. The opposite is a cemetery. Yes, please. I really don't remember. I'll tell you why. The pressure was so enormous, the hunger was so heavy, the beatings were so heavy, that yes, one, yes, another step. And frankly, <clears throat> I believe that I was too young to comprehend it too. And I think that, that was an advantage I had. I was too young to comprehend it. There was no one to protect you 
but on the other hand, it, uh, it, it had something there, and I can't explain it. All I can tell you, I don't remember everything that happened in the years in the camps. It's a good question, but uh, it's, it's something that is. When you're younger, you're different. You're, 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 you're more palatable, maybe. You're also less inquisitive, and you go with a sibling around you, I think. Can you, yes, please. Can you the German stem, the German and the SS. Did you feel hate or? More fear at that time. Yeah, yes. of course. Especially when we had the guards, that's all we knew. I remember in 44, the end of 44, one guard, since I spoke German, somewhere it was all over something, which very rarely happened, that he spoke to me. I was speaking to someone in German, and uh, he says, Do you speak German? I said, So. After a few days, he watched me, and he said to me, um, if you want to escape, I'll give you the address of my wife in, in, in Munich, München, and you can go there. Well, we saw daily, daily, when people tried to escape, they were not shot, they were hanged in front of us to scare, to scare us more so. I didn't trust this man. He may have been a fabulous guy, I don't know. But I couldn't trust him, because I was afraid that he wanted to use his, his, his rifle. So, uh, but that was then. Now my life, uh, is if I would hate all day long, I couldn't function. So I don't want to hate that much. Yes, sir. there's somebody there. It's a very good question. Well, it, it had to start with a few people, which it did. And uh, I said recently to, to someone, if I had been in charge in 1933 and had known what Hitler and his 12 people, so-called, would have done to the world, I would have killed them. It would have saved 51 million people. But that's, you know, that's nice to talk about it, but uh, uh, when I say I want to be hunted, that's, it's a joke, but we all, we all want to live. Uh, but um, I said to my friends, and they laughed, because I said, well, I want to beat Hitler, so I, so I can say I beat you for 100 years. It's a joke, obviously. Uh, but but I, I can now afford to say that because I have a good life. I have a wonderful family. I have a good life, and why not? And I'm healthy. Uh, one should always thrive, in my opinion, to make the best of everything. And even as you get older, uh, of course you're not as, as good as if when I was 20 or 30 uh, in, in doing things, but still you have to accept your, your place in, in, in life. But I, but I do believe that uh, your mental attitude is very, very important. That heals as much as, as any doctor can heal you. Up to a point, of course. But you have to have the will and, and, and the determination and the tenacity to do that. Does that answer probably? Not really. But I know I can't guarantee I'm going to be a man, but I'm going to try like hell, let me tell you. Well, it 
it's, ha it's happened. <clears throat> no one can explain that. Uh, times weren't as good as we have it now here, for instance, but still it wasn't, it wasn't, a des it wasn't destitute. Uh, they were searching for political leadership, and by the time they woke up, it was too late. And there was a following, that, uh, and the propaganda was there day after day after day. Uh, people couldn't go to a drugstore any longer, people like me, to get the medicine if you needed it. The doctors couldn't take care of you. It was against the law. The schools I've already talked about. And um, the, the people who are running the country, it started with a few, but it grew. Uh, they thought power? I don't know. No one can explain it properly. It's not, there are no books written about it, in my opinion, which explain the real motives. There may not even be motives. They just follow the trend. It's a tough one. And that's why I said earlier, we can make a difference. We shouldn't let that happen. It can happen anywhere. The wrong person uh, politically are in trouble. Yes, please, sir. Uh, my, my family came here from Russia in 1906. I'm your age. And they came in there one, one step ahead of being killed because they were Jewish, and it's uh, very fortunate about that. But everybody has been bedeviled by what it is that made Germans who are, after all, so highly cultured and civilized and so forth, on such a mass scale with so many people involved in persecuting destroying them, killing them, uh, degrading them. One possible explanation that I've heard, which makes sense to me, is that if you are going about to kill somebody, what, you hurt, in order to survive emotionally, you have to say to yourself, this is not a human being, this is a lower form of life, like a cockroach. <coughs> Certainly, because that's how they infiltrated the mind. There were lots of people who never met a Jew in their life. They never met one, because there weren't that many in, in Germany. It was a very, very small percentage, maybe 2% at the most. It's just the indoctrination day after day, the propaganda, and you said often enough, people start believing things. And that's what was happening. Same thing happened in, uh, in Iraq with the Kurds. Thousands of them. For only one reason. Different religion. In the Balkans. Anywhere. Because they, 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 if you repeat it often enough, people start believing it. And it sounds crazy, but it, it, must, it must have been the case then. Yes, please. Love. Say that again. Being on the wrong side of that propaganda, how did you feel like as a child when you saw these posters and you heard people talking you know, when you witnessed propaganda, how did you feel as a spirit? Well, it was very hard, obviously. I was a child, remember. Uh, there, there was, for instance, the, the Germans had a newspaper called the Stürmer, which was strictly based on this propaganda we are talking about. It went on and on. I also believe another thing, that Hitler needed something to unite the people, which goes back to your question, sir, to unite the people. And the simplest way of doing it was to take a, sm a minority, a small minority, who was not known to the general public. The majority of the Jews lived in the large cities. I was in a small town, but there were uh, 12 people there. It didn't mean anything. So if you can unite a concept 
and are able to sell that by propaganda, it will sell. And I think that's what happened in Germany. Because there was no problem until Hitler came to power in Germany. There was no problem. In Holland, we were arrested by the, in 1941 by the policeman in the small town we lived in, who was a good friend of my father's. He bought in my father, the family bought in my father's store. Why? Because he was told by the Germans that you are the policeman here, was the one and only in the whole town, and you, have, and you follow orders. And he did. Now, Holland also had quite a few people, I mean, not enough, but uh, people who were hidden. We called them were underground. And a lot of them were saved, a lot of, uh, half of them didn't. So, human people uh, do crazy things sometimes, whatever you want to call this. But it's, um, I, don't think, I don't think the books are written on, 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 on your question. And I don't think they ever will be written. I also believe that Primo Levi, possibly because of what he saw happening, uh, may have felt this, that, that he says, enough is enough, I don't want to go through it for the second time. And, and I tell you, and you all read the papers, it's not that, they, that they're picking on, on, on Jews, they're Christians being, being, being attacked just as well in certain parts of the world, and, and, and Muslims. And, and, and other religions. So there is a, it's, it's created by certain people and they, they find following. So it's a question I think I could speak for, for 10 days about and I still can get, find an answer. Do you have any more questions? Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>